everyone speaks of unity. Every sect um, of Islam, well, except for um, an odd few, everyone thinks of unity. What practical steps, um, in your opinion, do you think the Muslim Ummah should take to achieve that unity? Thank you very much, brother. I think it's, uh, I think it's a fantastic question which Hassan M has asked. Um, practical steps are vital. At the end of the day, we've mentioned these Imams, such as Imam al-Sadiq such as Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. And the aims of all these Imams was to try and get as close to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi as is possible. So we should be taking practical steps to have, number one, committees which are formed where different Imams of mosques which represent these different schools of jurisprudence meet on a regular basis to try and discuss the innovative, innovative jurisprudential issues which have arisen. Imagine now someone who's a Ja'fari comes and asks a question about a bioethical issue. And then there's someone who's a Hanafi who lives just six doors down in the local area who's asking about the same bioethical issue. These Imams of the mosques, when they're going to face these issues, have to come together to try and sit and understand what are the contemporary issues which their followers are facing. Number two, it's vital that we understand that the followers of these schools of jurisprudence have many personalities in history who they revere, who are common denominators. All of these schools revere Rasulullah All of them revere the Ahlul Bayt. All of them revere members of the Sahaba of Rasulullah So what's the harm in us having intra-faith dialogue where we make a day in each of these respective schools where everyone comes together to speak about that personality? As in, for example, in the week of Rabi al Awwal, all of us can come together and make a Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi day. Where the Imams and the followers of all these different schools come together. And where they sit and where they all give their angles about the greatness of the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Number three, all of these schools encourage justice. Encourage the removal of oppression. Encourage the seeking of knowledge encouraging the act of generosity so why can't we have a lecture or a seminar where we invite the leaders of these schools to discuss these beautiful traits unity doesn't mean we compromise our beliefs unity means we are willing to be tolerant of the beliefs of others in islam unfortunately with some muslims in the world today we've reached the stage where when you're told that you know what there's a lecture by a member of that school in islam i'll never listen to them they don't follow my school. No. You go and listen. You embrace and you are tolerant of the beliefs of others. But at the end, you may agree to disagree with the conclusions. But it is vital that when we live in the cosmopolitan environment that we live in, that we are able to come together with our mosques and forming seminars and forming committees where the leaders of the respective groups come and sit together. I want to take the discussion back to the topic of tonight, which is Imam al-Sadiq As you mentioned there, he was a figure of uh, bridging the gap between the uh, schools of Islam, the different schools. Tell us more about the times which Imam al-Sadiq lived in. Obviously, he lived in very, uh, um, you know, a tra great transitionary period, great time of great upheaval within the Muslim Ummah. Did this afford him the relative freedom to, you know, establish the? Because as you know, we know, Imam al-Sadiq established the University of Medina. He formed what is known today as the university faculty system. And he was the forerunner and the uh, most uh, for, foregoing uh, alim of his time, as you mentioned before. So, you know, what were the circumstances like and how did this give him this relative freedom to disseminate the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam? There seems to be a couple of incidents in the time of Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, with al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, which allow him to have this relative freedom. Uh, I remember reading an incident while Mansour was sitting down and uh, he witnesses that he can't get to Hajar al-Aswad. Mm. But he witnesses that Imam al-Sadiq gets straight there and he asks someone who's that and they say to him that's Ja'far ibn Muhammad. So what happened is that someone comes to ask him a question to Al-Mansur. He's like to him, we've got problems. What is it? He said, that we found one of the servants who's been killed, but he's been beheaded as well. And we don't know what the diya is. We don't know what the blood money is. So Al-Mansur said, well, do any of the scholars here know 
So all of them said, no, we don't. So he said, is there anyone who does? He said, Ja'far bin Muhammad can answer you. He said, bring him to me. When he brought the Imam, he said to him, what's the blood money of someone not just dead, but their neck has been severed? He said to him, it's a hundred dirham. He said to him, why? He said, on the basis that there's 20 dirham for each stage, and you find the nutfa and the mughda and the halaqa and so on until death, and that for each stage it is 20 dirham until you reach the amount. So this from Al-Mansur Dawaniqi, he looked at it and he said, well, this is something quite ingenious, but he still couldn't give him that freedom until one day he saw the Imam with the stick of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he said to him, I want that stick. And the Imam just said to him, here, take it. He couldn't believe how the Imam was willing to let go of it, but at the same time he said to him, look, I'll give you relative freedom now because you've done this act for me. And that relative freedom wasn't just a relative freedom to build an institution in Medina just for Muslims. Atheists would come to Imam al-Sadiq Atheists would come and they discuss with the Imam. Today we have in our mosque some speakers who are like, don't speak to atheists, stay away from atheists. What's wrong? I, believe, I have an ideology, they have an ideology. A human can't live without an ideology. I believe in the oneness of God, they don't believe in God. Let's come and discuss. Either my arguments will make sense to them, or maybe their arguments will make sense to me if I don't have that solid theological background to understand how to discuss. But let's discuss. So you found an atheist comes to Imam al-Sadiq A beautiful discussion. He says to him, show me God. So the Imam says, look at the sun. Mm. So the person looks at the sun and then suddenly he moves his eyes. So the Imam says, what's wrong? Why did you move your eyes? He goes, the rays of light of the sun were blinding me. He said, if you can't bear to see the created, how can you bear to see the creator? Mm. The sun's rays were hurting you. And you're telling me, show me God? Because there are a group of people today who believe they'll see God on the Day of Judgment. I beg them to stand in front of the sun with their eyes for about how long? For one minute, non-stop, staring at the sun without turning their eyes away. Mm. They tell you, we'll see God on the Day of Judgment. You can't bear to see the created. You expect to see the Creator. Mm. Please rethink your theological beliefs. Honestly, I get surprised with, with these anthropomorphists. Then you have, on the second level, an atheist who comes to a disciple of the Imam. And when we mention disciples of the Imam, we mentioned Abu Hanifa, we mentioned Malik, we mentioned Sufyan al thawri We didn't mention people like Hisham ibn al-Hakam. We didn't mention people like Mu'min al-Taq. There are a number of other disciples of the Imam. Wahab ibn Amr, who would later be known as Bahlul. There are a number of disciples of the Imam who represented the school of Ahlul Bayt. An atheist comes to uh, Hisham ibn al-Hakam, he says to him, uh, if God exists, can he fit the whole universe into an egg without the egg getting bigger or the universe getting smaller? I just want the audience to listen to this point. He says, if God exists, can he fit the universe into an egg, the whole universe into an egg without the egg getting any bigger or the universe getting any smaller? Hisham was thinking, well, I know he can, but I don't know how to give a logical reply. So at that moment, what happened? At that moment, Hisham went to Imam al-Sadiq He said, Imam, I have a dilemma. He said, what is it? He said, an atheist asked me a question I can't answer. He said, what is it? He said, if God exists, can he fit the whole universe into an egg without the egg getting bigger or the universe getting smaller? Imam looked at him and he said, simple. Hisham said, how? The atheist was listening. So the Imam turned to the atheist. He said, uh, do you have senses? He said, yes. He said, name them. He said, I can see, I can touch, I can taste, I can smell and I can hear. He said, what's the smallest sense you have? He said, my eyes. He said, what do you see with your eyes? He said, I see forests, I see trees, I see buildings, I see humans. He said, if God can fit all those things into your eye, then why wouldn't he be able to fit the universe into an egg? Anyone who's been to New York, <coughs> if you walk down Fifth Ave in New York, and you see the skyscrapers in Manhattan. You look at them. Have you ever thought to yourself that that skyscraper, how does it fit in this small eye? If your Lord can fit that whole skyscraper into this eye, then why can't he fit the universe into an egg? Mm -hmm. But the point was the tolerance. And that's what's missing in some of our communities. Muslims can't tolerate each other, mm -hmm. let alone tolerate non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. And that's something we have to change. We move into a 21st century. 
We, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, constantly speak of a Mahdi, a Mahdi, a Mahdi. This Mahdi is not going to come to kill humanity. He's going to come to build a humanity of tolerance, a humanity of empathy, a humanity where a person is willing to embrace the beliefs of others. Imam al-Sadiq never would you find anyone who would say, Imam al-Sadiq was the type of person, if an atheist come, he'd never show it. Atheist, you have a question? Yes. What is it? I can be a creator like your God. Imam said, sorry? He said, I can be a creator like your God. So what do you mean? He said, if you give me compost and you give me fertilizer and all these things, I'll get mud and I'll let worms emerge. I'll be a creator. Your God's a creator. There's no difference. So the person went, he got all this mud and compost, all these things, and there were worms which had emerged well, under the right conditions and so on. So he said to Imam Sadiq, look, I'm a creator. You should call me God as well now. Imam said, so that's your creation? He said, yes. He said, these worms are your creation? He said, yes. He said, okay, you're their creator? He said, yes. He said, can you tell me which worm is male, which one's female? Now, a worm is not the easiest animal in the world for someone to know what's male or female. He said, I don't know. He said, all right, no problem. He said, can you tell me the weight of each of your creation? No. He said, okay. He's like, your worms are heading one way. Order them to head the other. He said, I can't. He said, then how can you be a creator when you don't know the gender of your creation, the weight of your creation, and you can't even order your creation to go in a different direction? Mm -hmm. The point was that he was open for dialogue, and that should be the message we take from him tonight. Absolutely. And I believe we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum. I wanted to discuss this dua to the youths in particular years. That I was once speaking in another center in, in, in London. Different subject. I was not even speaking on Ilai Mumbala. And well, he, and I mean, I saw an alim, and he was dressed in, in, in his kaba and, his, and a black turban, so I knew he was a Sayyid. When he raised his hand, of course I gave him priority. But you see, we've got to be careful these times because some of these people come in the wrong garb. He called himself a, a, a Shia Sayyid. And he questions me, he says, what do you say about that dua which starts Ilahi Adam and Bala? I will not detain you on that history. In, in, in less than a minute, I'll finish this part of the story to come to the main point. He says, what do you say about that dua Ilahi Adam and Bala? And I mentioned to him the authorities that I mentioned to you. I said, well, I regard that as authentic. The first book that comes to our mind is Mufatih al -Jinan. The Sheikh Abbas Kumbi, Mufatih al -Jinan, has reported this from the 12th Imam Alayhi Salaam. Fortunately, I remembered the account of uh, Allama Tabrisi, Alayhi Rahma, put that to him. He says, oh, this is all, all uh, Shia fabrication. All this is not authentic because reciting this dua is shirk. And there is guna in it. I said, look, I, I cannot accept that at all. It's taught by an Imam, Alayhi Salaam, an Imam who was sent by Allah to stop us from shirk. If there is anybody who will teach us to keep away from shirk, it would be him. He would not be doing the contrary. But I said, this is not my subject. It's not a matter for discussion now. And I will not permit you to take time with the audience on that subject and cut him short. But I realize that there are agencies <coughs> within us who are promulgating this. And I thought we'd better make this clear. You can see from the first paragraph of this dua, it is a dua to Allah. 